Welcome to Two Cents FC. I'm your host, Amelia Kugo, back again with my guy, L. Each week, we'll be talking with individuals from around the soccer world, learning about their stories and getting their unfiltered thoughts and opinions. This week, we're joined by all-time legend, retired striker, and current director of Team Strategic Partnerships and Business Development at Columbus Crew SC, Dante Washington. We'll be talking all about his career as a player and his transition from the soccer field to the corporate world. Dante is a legend, uh, one of the OGs. Uh, when I was coming into MLS, um, I didn't know about him, but had to do my research. And yeah, it's been a pleasure to get to know him. Uh, Dante, how are you doing today? Doing well, man. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. Nah, thank you. So we start off with two truths and a cap. I'm going to let L give you the rundown, but I'm excited because I feel like, you know, I've done all my research on you, but I, I think I'm going to win this one, but I'm not sure. L's been killing me. So please help me out. All right, so two truths in the cap. This is um, a game where you give us three facts about yourself. Two will be true, one will be a lie, and a Moby and I have to guess what the lie is. And like a Moby said, you know, I'm pretty good, pretty decent at this game. You know, I'm up on them. So we'll see how this one goes. All right. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, let's see. I was born in Columbia, Maryland. I am distantly related to Josh Smith, the basketball player. And I'm the all-time leading assist uh, player in NCAA D- Division One history. Damn. Josh Smith is such a random name to, like, say. So I think that's true. Yeah. Assist. He was a striker. I'm going to go with the sis. I think you're all time leading scorer. Or at least you had a record at a, at your college. Uh, yeah, I, I do know you have DMV ties, but maybe, yeah, I'm going to sis too. Partly because I don't want to, if, if we both get it wrong, then it's good. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I am destiny related to Josh Smith, apparently through. <laughs> he said apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't confirmed it, but uh-huh. uh, it's a crazy story. But apparently I am like fourth or fifth generation or something like that. Um, actually, I'm not even sure how far down. Uh-huh. Uh, I was the leading assist player in NCAA Division One history. I was not born in Columbia, Maryland. I was born in Baltimore. Uh, Gosh. I would have stuck with my gut. That was that time. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay. I liked it. That was good. It was hard. Yeah. Like coming up with that, like off the top. Nah, but thank you. So first question we ask everyone is, when did you fall in love with soccer? Man, um, probably when I was about six, six or seven. You know, growing up where I grew up, uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of my peers played the game, and it was the most popular sport um in our area and like you said being from the dmv it's soccer hotbed back then so it wasn't wasn't too hard to find a friend find some neighbors other kids at the school who who were playing because pretty much everyone uh, growing up in, at least in my era uh, grew up playing soccer in some shape or form whether it's a recess playing on a rec team or something so uh it was it was pretty easy to fall in love that's amazing. Can you talk about that dynamic, you know, growing up, you know, in a soccer uh, infused culture? Because I know, especially, you know, from the outside looking in Baltimore, you think in basketball, you know, you think in football. Um, so what was that like as people talk about it now from the standpoint of like, all right, soccer's not readily available or, you know, people play in their youth, but then they grow out of it. So how was that for you, you know, being able to grow up with soccer? You know, it's odd because, um, again, being from that area, like Virginia, Northern Virginia, Baltimore, um, like the Rockville, Montgomery County, like all around the D.C., basically from between Baltimore and D.C., uh, soccer was was really popular. So I grew up not thinking any different. So I, you know, probably felt like most kids were, were out playing soccer, um, not realizing that later on that definitely was not the case. Uh, but especially where 
uh, in my town, my city where uh, I grew up, it was just one of those odd things. It was a planned community. Um, there's a, a lot of history and story behind it, but I think it was just one of those things where, uh, like my family, we moved out of the out of the city, out of Baltimore, uh, looking for more opportunities in, in Columbia, which created a lot of opportunities. Um, and soccer was just that sport that that everyone ended up playing. I mean, there are obviously people playing football, basketball, mm-hmm. baseball, but soccer just it's really took hold. Um, there are a number of players who have had success in college, youth national mm-hmm. team, youth national team. Uh, they came from Columbia. Nice. And I'm not trying to age you or anything because, uh, you, you know, I'm trying to respect my OGs. But how was it growing up? Like, you know, was it club soccer? Like, how did club soccer work, you know, when you were coming up? And did you have any, like, uh, black coaches growing up? So, um, yes, I did have a, a, a black coach, which was which is odd. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think when I was about – uh 11 12 and he coached me for a few years and i'm still in in, in touch with him um That's amazing. and he was like he's like a dad to me it was a dad uncle type of relationship because he was only 25 years old when he um started coaching us so he was really really young mm-hmm. and um so yeah it was it everything was the same same format grow up playing rec then you go to travel and uh, we had a huge soccer club in Columbia, so it still is rather large, not necessarily as successful as it used to be. Um, but there, the numbers, the sheer numbers, there were thousands of kids playing. Oh, that's amazing. And then, and can you talk about your experience, you know, you know, starting from youth and then moving up the ranks, you know, going to college and then, you know, going pro, you know, you know, being one of the, you know, first members in the MLS and, you know, doing all that it, the, the career that you've had is is a lot. Of, I feel like a lot more people need to know about it. So can, can you kind of, kind of give us some backstory into that? You know, it's funny because not having a professional league, a major league like we have now with all the notoriety that we have now um, never really gave me anything to shoot for. We had the NASL, but then by the time I um, got out of high school, got out of college, it was, was long gone. So, having something to aspire to, to be a professional. I didn't really think about being a professional or uh, playing on the national team. I may not want it to, but it just wasn't a reality. Uh, I wasn't very highly recruited uh, out of high school. And in fact, I went to Radford University and my coach tells the story all the time. Uh, he went to recruit a defender and then uh, <laughs> found me. Uh, I was always probably one of the best players on my team, but it I, I never played state team or anything like that. I got cut from state team, never made it to regional team. And it wasn't really until I got to college where uh, I really started kind of getting on the map uh, in terms of of, the, of having any type of uh, name and notoriety. Um, so it, I just really stumbled upon success. I didn't, wasn't out there with the personal trainer or individual trainer like we have now. I will say that I played all the time uh, and was fortunate to have good coaches at the youth and uh, high school level, which you know, obviously is that that base, that foundation. Uh, but I, I really just, I lucked up and got in the right place at the right, right time. I mean, uh, obviously when you score a lot of goals, uh, people are gonna start taking notice and uh, it just kind of all went from there. It was uh really odd it kind of all hit me at once because you know next I, i'm pretty much doing maybe an interview here or there in high school because even in high school i i think it was my not, definitely my so in high school there was a uh one of my best friends he was an all-american as a sophomore all-american as a junior and i was kind of as especially as a junior playing in his shadow then as a senior uh, he went to a different school, so then the workload was was basically on me. And I was the leading scorer of the team, but it's not like I had twenty or thirty goals. I may have had fifteen. I don't even know. Um, but once I got to college and that my freshman year at Radford, when I scored a lot of goals, that's when things really kind of took off and um, 
broke my leg my sophomore year, so I redshirted that that year, and then came back was was my junior year academically, led the nation in scoring again, and that's when we had these Olympic festivals, which then formed the pool for uh, the Olympic team, and then kind of the the, the rest is history really, because once you know once you get on the national teams, it just kind of changes things. Um, oh, exactly. I Can didn't. You- try to do that, any of that. <laughs> Can you talk about, you talked about like you played a lot of games, you know, there wasn't any any special thing that you did in terms of having a personal trainer. But if there's one thing, because, you know, we have some young people listening too, like there's one thing that you worked on, like did you work on finishing or any advice that you would have for a young player trying to come in? You know, you said you mentioned you score goals, so you're eventually going to get noticed at some point. But is there like one thing where, if you can go back in time or something that you did um, at the time that people can kind of focus on, um, what would that be? I guess it depends on what age um, where we're talking about. So if we're talking like the really young kids who like elementary, middle school, um, just continue to play as much as you can and mostly playing without coaches, just go out and play with your friends, just the free play because that's when all the fun happens and where you can try things that you might not get to do in practice. Um, and I know a lot of kids don't do that anymore. It's kind of disheartening to see that because I think that's when really the love of the game is, that's is, true. is born is when you're just out with your friends and you're just playing in the neighborhood and not necessarily having to listen to a coach who say, do it this way, do it that way. You just do it the way you want mm-hmm. and you, know, you can develop your skills that way. Um, I say that once, I got to college. That's probably when I became more focused on uh, things, making sure I stayed in shape, uh, the extra work, doing all those things. And I can remember one summer, I think it was the summer after my freshman year, I was just, Bradford was a small town. So on my run, I would just dribble all around the, the little town and, and, and that was part of my exercise. So I'd say I probably became more dedicated to the game later on um once i got to college and it, part of it probably ironically was one of my good friends who i think after my freshman year and i had you no know, had all the success and, and all of the stuff was going on and she's like you know what you could be really good if you actually dedicated <laughs> and tried yeah. <laughs> and, I, and i was like man that, that that's messed up yeah. <laughs> but she had a point she was yeah. right and you've had like an extensive career. Um, you know, we talked about like how you got to got to the point, you know, you've done Olympics. What were some highlights, you know, that when it's all said and done, some highlights that you always remember um, from your career? Man, it's one of the things I wish I had done is I, I'll say this to all pros as they start their careers is like journal, like write it down. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So many things that even like the little things, the little jokes, the inside jokes, the locker room stuff yeah. um, that you forget. Um, so in terms of highlights, if I can be talking about as a pro or just kind of throughout my whole soccer career. I'll say as a pro, yeah, his whole soccer career, yeah. So, I mean, coming as a youth, playing in the national finals at under 16 was a pretty special thing. Um I, ironically, there's a guy uh, when I went to play professionally and started with the crew, uh, the person who picked me up was uh, working in the front office of the crew. He was from California and had they beaten the team that we played in the finals, we would have played against each other. Wow. And it's just, I mean, you guys know the soccer community is so, so very, small. very small. Yeah. For him to be in the, like, actually be the person picking me up from the airport. And then another one of his teammates, who I've met many, many years ago since I've come back to Columbus, he lives maybe 10 minutes from my house. Um, so you know, that's when all the memories start, you know, coming back. Yeah. They're like, oh, my gosh, you were there. You were there. And especially if you, <laughs> like, kids don't have them now of the um, the tournament uh, brochures where you have yeah. the, you know, the pictures of the teams and all the names and all that stuff. And every now and again, like, my mom kept all that stuff. So I'm glad that she did because every now and again I would – look at him, I was like, oh my gosh, that guy played against him in college, or this guy, yeah. like, especially those types of things. Um, college just was was a blur, really. 
Um, I, I'd say probably between my probably my junior year was the, probably the biggest highlight. I mean, that's when I went and played in the Olympics. But also as as a team, we did really really well. We didn't in none of my four years that we make the NCAA tournament, but we played against the University of Maryland, who traditionally never uh, recruited any of the players from Columbia. And we came back and played them uh, at College Park and beat them, uh, I think it was two to one. Mm -hmm. And it was like a highlight because I think there were probably four or five guys on the team from from Columbia. So we were like, all right, we're in front of our friends, in front of our family, we're going to do this. And we were a pretty good team back then as well. Um, Then probably the the biggest highlight kind of at the – I won't even talk about the limits. I mean, that's just – that speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, but probably my first cap, first time playing with the national team were, was was amazing. I think I was only 19 or 20. I think I was 20 maybe. And just, you know, a year or two prior to that, these are guys that I'm looking up to. Like Eric went all that mm-hmm. telling that all the time. I was like, I'm looking up to these guys. And these are guys I wanted to be uh, playing yeah. with. And never in my wildest dreams that I think I would have been. But yet there I was. And uh, in camp and being on the same field as them and scoring the first goal as as a as an international was was very special. Um, yeah, now, you, lots, you, took, memories, man. you you touched on the Olympics and it's a it's a it's a touchy subject for me because you know we had the chance to go to the 2012 Olympics and we didn't qualify and. U.S. hasn't qualified in quite some time. <laughs> but you were there in 92 when the Dream Team was there. How was it? Like, did they have the Olympic Village back then? Were you guys able to interact with them? Like, how was that tournament? Um, I know at that time, I'm sure, 92. Who, who ended up winning that for, for, for the soccer? It was in Barcelona and Spain won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they had a lot of top talent at that. Yeah. yeah a lot of top talent. Cap actually was on that team. Oh, Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was so that, that experience was bananas. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we had the Olympic Village. Uh, we played in Barcelona, but then moved to another city. So we only got to spend uh, some time in the in the Olympic Village. We actually didn't spend more time until we came back after uh, not qualifying for the next round. Uh, but we played uh, Italy, Poland and Kuwait. Uh, Poland ended up uh, getting the silver medal uh, and playing against Spain in the final. But uh, we actually were lucky enough. I was on TV uh, in the opening ceremonies, walking in with the dream team. Oh, uh, it was amazing because they didn't stay at the Olympic Village. They stayed at a hotel uh, not too far, you know, and in Barcelona, not too far from the Olympic Village. Um, but even... So the way that it worked is the opening ceremonies was in the um, in the stadium and there was a small arena, I think it was maybe gymnastics or some other events uh, were right next to that arena, mm-hmm. or that stadium. So all of the athletes were in the arena waiting their time to process in. So they would call the country name and keep going. And we're, I'm looking back, like all of us are looking, we're like, where's the dream team? Where's the dream team? <laughs> Looking back, like all the major, all the big time track athletes were sitting right behind us, and we're looking at them. I think it was like Mike Conley, I think was maybe the name, like some of the big, big sprinters yeah. and triple jump, long jump. Carl so Lewis, and then we, we were all in all looking at them, and they're still they're looking around like, where's the dream team? Yeah. So the way that they process, they so you go out, you walk along this path to get to the stadium, and they had us separated by. Uh, females were first and then the, the men. So we were walking in and we're walking and they stop us and we're like, like right about to go down under a, under a bridge and they stop us and we're all looking at each other like, why are they stopping us? And we look up and there they are. There's a dream team. Yeah. So they just stopped and we just walked. So, I mean, it was crazy how packed it was. Uh, even once we were finished processing we're just standing on the infield. Like I felt like the whole infield was packed because everyone was, we were so close together. It yeah. wasn't I turn around and realize like everybody's trying to get 
close enough to the dream team um, because, I mean, who wouldn't want to see them? And yeah. the only ones who weren't there were Bird, um, MJ, and Christian Leitner, but everyone else was there. So we got pictures. I mean, even other athletes, as they were, you know, supposed to be having their, you know, their glory, raising their hand, they're taking pictures of <laughs> each other walking around. No, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm low-key getting jealous just hearing that story because, like, Olympus is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And, you know, as the U.S. not being able to qualify, like, it, that's a whole nother podcast that we can get into. <laughs> but um, it's amazing that you got to experience that and, like, you know, share that story. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, you know, you mentioned with your career starting, there wasn't, you know, a professional league. And then there was, I mean, 94 World Cup came and then MLS came. And I'm sure you can give us like a MLS history version of how that all came about. But how was that experience for you going pro and, you know, establishing your career with the Columbus crew and other teams? Well, once I um, started having success in, in college, I, there was other leagues. There were indoor leagues and there were other outdoor leagues that were obviously, like I said, much smaller than than MLS. And I wanted to play wherever I could. So I actually went on trial in 92 in Germany. Um, I went to Holland first with Ajax. And then I went to Duisburg. Um, and I think it was both in, in 93. Um, regrettably, I, I didn't stay. I didn't make it in with Duisburg. I went over, I was carrying a little injury and I probably shouldn't have gone at all. Um, but I probably should have stayed in Ajax because I was having, they wanted me to stay and train with their, uh, a second division club that was not too far from, from Amsterdam that their um, assistant coach he used to coach there and had connections. But back then it's like, now it's so easy. You can just go yeah. crash on a guy's couch <laughs> and hang out and train with their team. But there's just, there weren't any, I don't even know if there were any Americans in, Holland, definitely not. And in yeah. Europe, probably a couple. So I came back. Um, and then I just I played indoor for two seasons in a continental indoor soccer league. Um, then I, I worked for the World Cup, just working. So I was always kind of still close to the game. Um, then I was working in New York because I once the league started, I actually didn't start when the league started. Um I came in, I think, in May or June. Uh, I was working in New York for NBC, um, just for their Olympics unit, completely yeah. removed from soccer. Um, and then, actually, the coach that I was, the black coach that I was telling you, uh, he was like, hey, you should be playing. I was like, nah, nobody wants me because they'd already gone through the draft and no one had reached mm -hmm. out to me or anything like that um, about playing. So I just, I thought, I thought I was done be honest mm -hmm. i had pretty much written it off and he goes well let me call make some calls and john ellinger is also from columbia yeah. so he called john ellinger because i would known john since i was in high school or before, even before that um he called john john called tom fitzgerald who was the assistant at the time with the crew who knew me from which we had back then was the national b team so it was, we had like the a team and the b team yeah um, so he knew me from that. And I left uh, NBC two weeks before the Olympics were starting to come play in the league. No, it's, it's, it's what I took from that story is it's always important to have a coach that's in your corner, you mm -hmm. know, your coach that believed in you to continue to play um, and then making the, the calls. And then obviously you had to do the work to, you know, get on the field and perform. Yeah. Um, You've played with a lot of talented players. Can you real quick name, like, if you had a five aside, who you who you who you bring in from your days in MLS or uh, national team squad to play alongside you? Wow. And don't worry, we're not going to try to get you in trouble with someone if you leave them out. No. So goalkeeping, probably Brad Friedel. Mm -hmm. Um. Claudio. Um. Man, this is hard. So many players over time. I'm just yeah. thinking of ones that come. Uh, Leonel Alvarez okay. uh, from Colombia. He basically was did all the dirty work for Pibe. Um Alain Sutter from Switzerland. 
Okay. Uh, 94 World Cup, he tore us up. <laughs> um, what defenders can I get some love to? Um, obviously, Eddie Pope speaks for itself. Played with him in Salt Lake. How many is that? Is that five? Yeah, Four? I mean, I feel like you can give like a, a seven-a-side squad or a best 11. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's <laughs> um, – I feel like I'm missing someone big. I mean, there are, uh, there are a lot yeah. that I could could rattle off. Um, that's that's a good thing. Uh, who? Jeff Cunningham. Oh, yeah. Ooh, legend. So, yeah. Okay. Now, I think that the great thing about, uh, obviously, your career, you've played a, a long career. You had a long career. You played a, a, against and with a bunch of talent. You know, and everyone has their own styles. Everyone has their own like nuances that they bring to the game. Um, can you talk about, you know, because I know you from the stuff that we do with MLS. Um, can you talk about like your post playing career and like um, the transition into the corporate world? Like, how was that for you? And like when you did retire, how how did it come about? Because sometimes it may be an injury, maybe father time. And, you know, did you like control y- your retirement or how did it go about? Well, uh, probably like 99% of all, uh, actually all former professional athletes. Um, I wanted one more year just to try and figure out what I wanted to do, but I wasn't afforded that opportunity. So I was in Salt Lake, uh, finished my career in MLS with Salt Lake and moved back to Maryland with my family. And I mean, it was hard. Mm-hmm. Um, that is not an easy transition. Uh, it's something that I advocate for now with current players uh, to prepare for what's next. Um, Brian Dunseth and I would talk about it. We remember talking about it when we were together in Salt Lake. And like, nope, we're not thinking about what happens next because our thought process back then was if we're not if we're thinking, thinking about, about what's next, then we're not yeah. 100% in, but that's yeah. absolutely not accurate yeah you look at all the other major athletes and they're building businesses while they're playing and that's what you should be doing making those connections while you're playing because there's no better time that you're going to meet a lot of people and people who may want to uh, be alongside you when you're done playing and to help you than when you are playing that you're not you're not going to be any hotter than you are uh, than when, when you're playing um so I, I really bounced around. I did mortgages and I really got lucky um, where I was doing mortgages and I got out literally right before the complete boom in 2008, 2007, 2008. Um, I was, like I said, I was living back in Maryland with my family. Um, and when you do mortgages, I, I thought, man, this should, this should be somewhat easy to build my book of business. Um, Know a lot of people, people buying houses, but of course people weren't buying a lot of houses back then. (laughs) Um, Then everything felt, you know, the the bottom dropped out. Uh, But I was, I went to a DC United game and as I was walking in, uh, I just happened to walk past uh, Kathy Carter, who used to be the uh, president of some, was running for U.S., soccer president um and she said hey and i hadn't seen her in years i mean it probably been an easy four or five years if not longer because we worked together when we worked when i worked for the world cup in 94 in different departments but we both worked for organizing committee and she said we're um coming up with these regional ambassador positions with the league would you be interested and one thing led to another. I was like, well, absolutely, because I'm broke as a joke. It ain't even funny. And she was like, well, let's, let's here, call me. And over time, that's what I ended up doing for, for a couple of years. Um, and then that ended, you know, kind of all things MLS. They tried it out and then we're like, eh, 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 yeah. not sure about that. Um, so, yeah, I had to scramble and I went back went back to college, I told myself I am never going to school again. And I applied at Ohio State, 
um, got into B school and did the two years in B school, interned at Nationwide, uh, then ended up working at Nationwide for like, I think it was eight years. And yeah, it was eight years. And then I left there to go go play for the crew. I mean, go go work for the crew. So yeah, it's been a been a wild ride and uh, yeah, that, that transition is is not not fun. No, I can only imagine, you know, um, and I love that you, you know, you speak to, you know, the rookie symposium every year and you do a lot of uh, work throughout the year with, you know, at athletes and uh, soccer players, you know, not only for Columbus, but throughout the league and even other sports. Can you talk about some of the challenges that, you know, you know, I, I'm going to have to do it at some point. And I love how you said one more year because it's always <laughs> one more year. You're always trying to get one more year. Uh, I think I could do one more year. Like, if I can get a one year contract out of you. So like that concept is like ringing true when, you know, my first year, I wasn't even thinking about that. Like I'd hear like older players say, I'm like, Oh, okay, whatever. Right. Um, so like, can you talk about some of those challenges? Which, which ones challenges of what? Like the, just the challenge of like, all right, I'm done playing. All right. What are some things that I have to like look out for or even like do? I forget who I said this to the other day was a former player because we were talking about like when you're done, yeah. like when you're done, you're done. Like, <laughs> checks stop coming. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously you were, I was fortunate. I played for a number of years. I never had to think about the check not coming. Um, I didn't have a family and, and you know, wife and kids, but I, I can't imagine what the stress level would be like for guys who uh, have to support a family. Hmm. Uh, I'd say the biggest thing is that, I mean, we, I did what I loved um, and I was fortunate to do it for a long time. I said I wanted to do it up until it was like three things. If I wasn't loving it anymore, if my body couldn't handle it and I wanted to try to make it to 35 and I did all three things, um, I didn't get that one more year to get to 36. <laughs> um, but just trying to figure out what's next is, uh, is hard because, you know, we don't realize that we do have traits and we do have skills that can transfer over into the business world. And once I uh, began to realize that, um, realize that there are companies who love hiring athletes. And I had thought about starting like my own little side thing of helping athletes make that transition. It still kind of comes back to my mind every now and again. Uh, because Eddie, actually Eddie Pope and I had this conversation where, uh, someone that he knows who worked, who used to work for Lockheed Martin, uh, she said that anytime someone came in her office crying cause they were stressed about something at work, it was never an athlete. Yeah. And I've talked with other people as well. Like, do you want to hire athletes? Like, yes, because we have all those intangibles uh, that many, like I would say regular workers don't have, mm -hmm. um, they might have it, but we've been drilled to, uh, be able to work as a team, uh, overcome adversity, be creative. Um, so once you can, you realize that there is value. Um, but the hardest part really is like, you know, there's kind of two parts to it. It's the, what do I want to do? And what can I do? Um, the, what can you do is easier because it's like, again, uh, especially with soccer players, you know, we, most of us have gone to college and I, I also have this theory and I could be completely wrong, but I feel like, uh, because we are, we spend so much time analyzing and making decisions, uh, because there are no plays in soccer. Yeah. So we're always having to figure out where do I need to be? Uh, where's the ball? All the anticipation where we're thinking steps ahead. Whereas most other sports, basketball still has plays. Hockey still kind of has plays. Obviously football does. So when you talk about these team sports, like we have a general strategy of when we get out there, but uh, we still have to implement the plan and things are changing on the fly. So I think that as soccer players, our level of thinking is different than many other athletes. But uh, once we are able to then take that and then figure out what we want to do, 
um, that's when that's the, that's the hard part because again we play the game for so long it's what we love to do we don't want to do anything else so then trying to figure out what it is that I want to do next is was really um, challenging. No, you bring up a lot of great points, and I think and I just said this quote to someone the other like like a couple hours ago actually is like the most dangerous thing in the world is an athlete that knows that they can compete in another arena. Like you said, we have all the qualities. We just had to learn how to translate these qualities that we learn from sport yeah. into the corporate space. And, you know, you, you mentioned that it took you a while, but you eventually got it done. You did B school and then you worked at it nationwide. And then now you're working at Columbus Crew. Can you talk about, you know, your specific role and, you know, what you're doing um, with uh, Columbus Crew? Well, it's a role that we made up. Uh, <laughs> completely. He's like, we just, hey, we just need Dante here. We're gonna, we're gonna make something happen. <laughs> no, it was one of those things where um, I was actually becoming bored and disgruntled at Nationwide. And as I saw the team was going to stay, I had a conversation with our, you know, one, the local ownership group, uh, Dr. Pete Edwards, and said, "I'd love to be involved." Uh, and I really had no idea what that was going to look like. So kind of as that was happening and then I was disgruntled, I was like, you know what? Well, because then I was put in touch with someone else. He's like, well, just come up with a, a, a job description. And my whole thing with them is like, based on all the things that I've done, there isn't uh, like one role that really um, utilizes me with all the different different experiences and skills that I have, whether it be the many years being involved with the game at a number of different levels um, to be like player used to be on the board of directors, all that for us soccer. Um, and then obviously being in B school and then working at nationwide, just working in marketing or working in corporate sponsorships, partnerships, and just didn't make, or just being on a soccer side just didn't make sense. So we just crafted a role that I work in partnerships and business development across both the soccer and the, in the in the business side, a uh, big part of it is so I kind of put it into chunks of youth business development. So our camps, our clinics, uh, we just started a youth partnership program. So basically, like an affiliate program, working with the local clubs uh, as a as a partnership program, uh, player engagement. So uh, current players. So at some point, it was really hard last year because I wasn't around the team. Uh, and now with us all having a facility, it'll be easier of uh, working with, I really call it like the the current, the uh, past and the future. So our academy kids, our higher potential academy kids working kind of as an off the field mentor uh, and also some of the younger pros who are just starting out. Because uh, you know, like you said, when you first started out, some of it you just didn't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to help those guys as they make that transition, uh, do our alumni engagement as well. And then kind of the third bucket is just the, the corporate uh, and community partnership. So more that could be strategic partnerships where it's not necessarily where someone's giving us money. It's where we like COSI as our local science museum actually was rate number one in the country by USA Today. Uh, we're, we're working with them. Uh, we have a partnership with them. We work with them in terms of like developing a science of soccer series. So the science of of the game and we produce work with them to produce a number of videos during COVID that they used on digitally. And, um, you know, now that we're all coming out of COVID, we'll see what the relationship looks like. So I just kind of, and then all other duties as assigned, I just get thrown in a other stuff, uh, appearances, spokesperson, that type of stuff. No, that's amazing. I think, you know, what I take away from that is that, you know, your reputation speaks for itself. So people are willing to, you know, go to bat for you. And then you're also progressive and uh, proactive about, you know, pursuing opportunities that you see. And I think it's really important because you touched on it, you know, when you're in your transition, you have to like, you know, see opportunities, but also take advantage of the opportunities given to you. Um, but you also have to have a good reputation. People don't want to work with people they don't like. So um, that's amazing that you've done that. Um, and congratulations to all the new things happening with crew. Uh, but one thing that we definitely got to ask is the, the rebrand, you know, how did that come about? And like, what would you guys' motives? If you got, if you could speak on it, I'm not sure. And then like, kind of like, 
you, you know, with your marketing background and your history as a player, um, you know, seeing some of the feedback and then making the changes, uh, we'd love to get your expertise on and insight on that, that kind of ordeal. So I didn't, I wasn't close to the rebrand at all. You said he's taking, he's taking all, he's not trying to take it. I will say that it all, I didn't find out about it until it was already, already baked and and done. Mm -hmm. Um, but kind of obviously hindsight's 2020 looking, looking back on it. Um, I think we learned our ownership group learned, uh, of what was really important to our, to our fans, uh, cause they spoke pretty loudly. <laughs> um, and yeah. if I'll also say that I know a lot of our former fan or our, not a lot of, ooh, a lot of our fans like the former logo, the, the circle one, mm-hmm. Um, anytime you have a change in management leadership, you know, they're going to come in and make their own statement. I mean, yeah, you have to former, you know, our former owners, they came in and, and made the changes and changed the logo. Um, it just was that a lot of people actually, I think the process was started before he actually took over, mm-hmm. um, but he gets credit for that. And a lot of people liked it. And, you know, I think some people didn't want the old logo, the, the original logo to change. So no one likes change. Yeah. And especially when it's something that becomes you're so passionate about, um, they're going to speak loudly. Uh, I think the one thing that made it even more challenging for us was that it was when you took crew out and it's just SC Generally, once when it was added, people are like, well, we don't need the SC. Yeah. So it wasn't a part of our uh, of our name, of our identity that, that a lot of people um, were attached to. Our fans are definitely, I mean, as you saw, um, tied to to the crew. It was it always been in our logo, even and it was hard because once it leaked it, we were playing catch up. Yeah. And it was that in the way that it looked as well, it was just a really grainy, crappy picture on a, a sweatshirt um, that in all of the drawings and anything that I saw, I had never seen that picture. So I didn't even know where that came from when it was leaked. Um, so even as we try to tell the story of like, listen, we're not getting rid of the crew name. We're actually doubling down on it. It was just really confusing for our fans because well, if you're doubling down on it, why are you taking out of the logo? Yeah. And I think what I heard from our fans was, listen, we saved, the crew was it's saved. Cool. Yeah. And that's what we need to have. Save and the crew, yeah. You can say that you're um, not taking it out, but we all know that once you do logos and, and stuff like that, the trickle on effect is, um, is huge. So if you take it out, then it's harder to put back in Mm -hmm. and you know, you can see at our stadium, we've still used the crew on a lot of stuff. Uh, The partnership program that, um, that we launched part of that is called the crew network. So the crew was never going anywhere, but we have a fan base who was told the team's not going anywhere and was told that for three and a half, four years. And then all and behold, like, Oh yeah. Er I'm trying to take the team to Austin. Yeah. So I don't think that um, that that point was probably considered enough. But um, we listened to them and we made the change pretty quickly. And that was, I'm sure, a very costly change because we had tons of stuff that were in production uh, of everything. Yeah, but the good thing about that is that the ownership group wasn't, you know, didn't have a big enough ego and they were humble enough to make that change and listen to the fans because, you know, owners come and go, players come and go, but the fans will always be there. Yep. And I think for you guys to respond in that matter um, shows the community uh, yep. and the crew, you know, save the crew. I remember the, the efforts that everyone involved in that community did to save the team. And I, I, I really hope that... Uh, I can't wait to watch that Austin game in Columbus 
Um, they might not I have think, to schedule that. <laughs> they, I feel like that has to. They have to schedule that game. Uh, just, just for uh, instigation purposes. I think that would be that would be that would be fun. And you know, you guys just opened the stadium. I know L was there live. Um, yeah. So L, take it away. I know you you got some stuff to say about that. Yeah, man. The atmosphere was great. The place was packed. Um, didn't get a chance to to meet you um i was close i know ty was trying to make the connection but it was a little chaotic right after march so i had to let you do your thing um but next time i'll be i'll be back out there for the atlanta game so next hopefully we can we can link up then for sure um so while i was there though i saw a few groups of young black kids you know who were like around the stadium um so what effort is the crew doing to kind of tap into the black the local black community so it's a big thing that i'm trying to uh focus on so Wow, where do I start? So we've put in, I think, four mini pitches uh, in partnership with Columbus City Schools and Columbus uh, Parks and Rec, uh, which obviously those are predominantly in in the city of Columbus. Uh, as part of the partnership program, I hope to be able to, and we've already had conversations with the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YMCA's, Parks and Rec, of how we can um, really in, in, engage in uh either expose these kids in these in the, the black kids in those areas uh, more to soccer or the ones that are already playing connect with them. Uh, one of the stories that we, we like to tell is uh, in the beginning of 2020, 2020, we have the Black and Gold Week, which is a number of events that we do leading up to the first game of the, of the season. We did a clinic at a local YMCA uh, and a bus full of kids came over from a uh, parks and rec center um, to take part in the clinic. And so we were sitting there and I look out and there's about 20 kids who get off of a bus. Uh, and there were a couple of kids who were really talented uh, anywhere from like eight or nine up to 16 years old. Out of that clinic, we, brought in two kids into our academy and they're both of them are playing in our academy on our U14 team right now. Um, and we want to make this happen more often. Um, and actually one of the uh, clubs or one of the organizations in our partnership program does a lot of work uh, in the city with trying to um, work with, with, with the black community. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but uh, we're not af we're not afraid to to try and tackle any of the issues that that may present themselves, whether it be transportation and obviously just exposure. But we have a large African population, uh, specifically Somali, Ethiopian, um, in Columbus, and a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, a lot of Ghanaians, Nigerians. So there are a lot of um, boys of boys and girls of color, obviously we're thinking a lot on the boys side, uh, but even if there are girls um, who are playing the game and we, we want to find out where they are. So I've had a number of conversations with, I uh, had a conversation with a Liberian organization who wanted help uh, setting up their, their club because they had kids playing with adults and like we need to, we don't know, they don't know what we don't know. So I connected them with uh, a friend of mine, uh, another black guy who helps run one of the big clubs around here to help them do all the things they need to do to get themselves set up. So uh, we're, we're working on it. We're, we have our eyes on it, but right now it's just me and one other person trying to do all of this. And this is just um, one part of my, my job, but it's something we're really looking forward to. Yeah, definitely don't hesitate to, you know, tap in with us. I know you talk with Ty a lot, so um, we're, we're happy to come do some activations and stuff like that and maybe throw some ideas around. So we'd love to get involved any way we can. Sure. I'm sure. Um, I know you touched on some of it. Uh, so what are, like, some key initiatives for the next two to five years um, for the team to grow its fan base? Well, I think a lot of it just we, – we did a good job – uh, with this first game, I think of kind of um, putting the city on notice. Um, you were at the march. 
we don't know how many people were there. We're, we're estimating, guesstimating somewhere between four to five thousand people. Wow. Um, that's in the sea really, of people. That's really good. That's really good. Literally. It was it was amazing. Um, once I find so I was leading it, and then once I finally got to the stadium and turned around and looked, I couldn't see the end of it. Um, and we designed the the march to start in the short north area, which is a really popular area, uh, and come down what's High Street, which is the major street in uh, in Columbus, and then to come down towards the stadium. And just the looks on people's faces when we were coming down, these are just like non-soccer folks. They are in the restaurants, they're taking pictures, they're on the sidewalk, they're taking pictures, taking videos, um, because it was it was a big deal. Um, so I think we have to um, continue to, to, to build on that. And obviously once the people who had tickets got into the stadium, the stadium speaks for itself. I mean, the, the place is, beautiful and we're still a lot more work that needs to be done uh there were some concessions we have parking that we need to address i mean it's going to get there um but in terms of initiatives i don't know if we have any specific initiatives i know one thing that i'm trying to work on is uh really connecting with the the college age kids more mm -hmm. so part of what we did on saturday was had so blocko is the biggest student organization at ohio state we had members of their board who came to the game um, and, and were part of the march. And out of that, we want to be able to continue to talk to them to see you know, how can we work together to, to get more OSU students to, to the game. Uh, because we've got 50, 60,000 students, whatever it is, at, at Ohio State. And uh, we see, see them as being um, like our future fans, whether they're coming from Ohio or if they're coming internationally. We, actually talk with the group of uh, Ohio State's uh, undergrad last year with ways that we could engage the, the, um, the college students. And some of them said the international students, especially ones who are coming from countries that uh, are really, you know, soccer or popular countries, they're looking for, their, for a home when they come here because they don't have anything. So if we could be that something that they gravitate to, they, they think that that would be uh, a plus for us. Um, so I can't think of any other like specific things, but I mean, we're, we're definitely trying to, to, to get more people involved and engaged. I'd say that probably the partnership program that, that I've started, it's really about growing the game of soccer, whether it be little boys or girls and, and getting their parents, uh, involved and, uh, kind of understanding who the crew is and what our vision is of who we want to be in, in the future and, and really trying to think be out of that, you know, making them feel like they're a part of the family because uh, in the past, the local youth soccer community, we're, we're at odds with the crew. And we, mm -hmm. over the past year and a half, I really spent a lot of time trying to mend fences and mend relationships and have, have done so. Uh, but we want them to be a part of the family because the thought process is if you feel like you're part of the family, then you're probably going to be more inclined to buy merchandise or go to games and speak highly of us rather than kind of the, the uh, I would say, the combative relationship that maybe um, they had in the past. So um, I think those are probably things that I'm specifically trying to work on, and I'm sure there are other things that you know, in other areas of our, our organization that they were working on as well. No, I love that. And, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, what I do love about the crew is that there's representation on the field. You know, if you look across the if you look across the team and you have, you know, young black kids and families come to a game and, you know, they see people that look like them. It's more attainable when it comes to, all right, I want to be like Nagby when I grow up. or I want to be like I want to score goals like Jossie or I want to defend like Jonathan Mensa. You know, that's 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 kind of what it's all about. And as we continue to try to find games, uh, not only to the black community, but other minority communities. That, that that representation and activation uh, is really important. It's funny you say that because when I played here, I think it was a 2000, 2001, uh, I think half of the team or a little over half were black. Oh, so, so maybe it's a Columbus thing. It, it might be a Columbus thing, man. <laughs> it was, we, we always laughed because we're like, oh, we're the majority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right.
All right. I know we got a new segment. L, what you got for us? Yeah, so let's go ahead and jump into uh, No Car, Yellow Car, Red Car. So this is a rapid-fire segment of the show where I'll read off some uh, news topics, and you'll give your opinion on those new top- news topics um, using the soccer card system. So No Card is I agree with it or I'm cool with it. Um, yellow Card is I can go either way. And Red Card is um, obviously I disagree or I'm not cool with it. And we'll kind of give um, an explanation of why you gave that card um, for each one. So got it? Got it. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, first one, NCAA will now allow college athletes to profit off of their name, image, and likeness. So what card are we giving NCAA for this ruling, finally? Um, I would say red card, only because I can't make no money off of it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, no, that ship done sailed, so yeah. I'm, I'm good with it. No yeah, no card. The uh, the only thing, if, you know, being bitter, I'd say yellow card because why did it take so long? But no card. I think it's going to be good. And the only thing I'm looking out for is that, you know, just making sure the student athletes are prepared, you know, now that they're going to be making money from a financial literacy standpoint and just, you know, personal development standpoint. Yeah, let's tap into that frugal athlete. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. For sure. All right, next one. Um, Shakira Richardson will miss the Olympics due to suspension for testing positive for THC in her system. Now, marijuana is on the Olympics banned substance list, but many are arguing that it shouldn't be due to legalization in many places, including the place where she consumed it. Um, so what card are we giving the Olympic Committee in this situation? Giving the Olympic Committee? Yeah. I'm I'm cool. With, well, it's kind of hard. Maybe a yellow card because I I think they're just not there yet in terms of changing their rules and guidelines because it sounds like they're moving that direction. But you also at the same time these are the rules and these are the rules that every athlete has to abide by. And if you let one go through, then the rest of them should go through. So. Yeah, I'm going to give it a yellow card. I mean, understanding the situation from a mental health perspective, like what she was going through. But at the same time, like these are the rules. Like I remember we didn't even qualify. Like we were in the qualifying round and the amount of things that we had to go through, like the testing and the telling them where we're at. Like that's there's a reason for that. And it's it's not just the like they're saying because of the United States, but it's the Olympics. It's a world governing body. So I know there's a bunch of people on different sides of the spectrum, um, but I think it's a yellow card. Uh, us, and it's unfortunate, but th- th- these rules are put in place, but it's going to create a conversation for people to hopefully make some changes around it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and last one. Um, so Copa America semifinals. Um, uh, thriller of a, of a shootout between Argentina and uh, Colombia. We had Emmy Martinez and Messi talking trash to the Colombian players during the Copa America or during the PKs. Um, so, what card are we giving? Uh, would it be Would it be Emmy and Messi in this case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What card are we giving them for you know their trash talk during the PKs? No card. <laughs> I'm mean, just testing. You know, some people are like, "Oh, they're you know got to respect the game." I know baseball; they're like they're they're really um, stubborn in their ways. But you know, I had to include that in. I say no card. I love it. I think we need to see more of that in soccer, especially soccer in the states, like the dark arts or like that flair, that culture. Um, obviously, within reason. But you know, even when the guy um, that scored on the goalie did his little dance, like. All that stuff is that's what that's what soccer is about. Different cultures, different philosophies all coming together and making a, a spectacle spectacle of it. And it's already happening on the field. They just yeah. don't really hear it. <laughs> exactly. I, as much stuff as players say on the field, it just happened that they caught it. <laughs> Thank golf. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick, who do you have winning? Um, Copa America, Argentina or Brazil? I haven't watched enough of it. I watched a little bit uh, the other night. Um, so I don't know if I can make, I haven't watched enough to make a make a determination. Um, you probably have to say 
Messi may say Argentina because I what you I were saw, right the first time. What's that? <laughs> I said you were right the first time. <laughs> Messi, yeah, Team Messi. yeah, yeah, because he just it's the one thing that he has not done, and I feel like he's probably going to die on that field, yeah. so to speak, to win that game because it's the one thing that's eluding him. I mean, I'm sure yeah. it's got to be eating at him. Yeah, I can only imagine. I like, yeah, I, I'm so excited to watch that game. And then, real quick, obviously, Euros and Copa, like, you've seen a lot of PKs. Normal MLS old school PKs or just regular PKs? You mean like the shootout? The shootouts, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I mean, I'm, I'm a purist at heart because mm-hmm. those shootouts were, the shootouts are definitely more dramatic. It's, is, you, is it harder to score in shootouts or regular PK? Um, yeah, I would say harder. Okay, interesting. Because you have you're on a time crunch. Yeah. And you can only get one shot at it. <laughs> so it's like five seconds, dribble down, keeper gets a touch on it, probably saved it. Yeah. Um, back then, too, the field, some of those fields are a little dodgy. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, you might not get a good roll, too. I see. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's it for this week, man. Well, Dante, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, for people that may want to connect with you, you know, whether it's, you know, advice on how to transition, um, whether it's, you know, B-School, soccer, um, or anything else, Columbus Crew, uh, how can they get in touch with you if, they're, if you're able and, you know, follow with some of the stuff you're doing? You can... Uh, Twitter is probably the easiest place to find me. I'm most active there. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Or you can email me at, at the crew, dwashington at columbuscrew.com. Okay, perfect. So we're going to have all that information in the show notes. Make sure you guys check out Columbus Crew, uh, MLS Cup Champions 2020. Yeah, right. oh, get my ears. Yeah. MLS Cup Champions got a good squad, a lot of talent. Uh, Good infrastructure and they're doing a lot of beautiful things i heard the stadium's amazing i heard the training facility is just like even next level um it's, so you guys yeah, yeah it's like imagine that coming up in a you know <laughs> different level <laughs> so the way so i don't know i want to take up all your time but um the espn broadcast crew came in this for this weekend and uh the way that i told them so we were at the training facility and they're like this is Brian Dunseth was like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And I said, so imagine the detail and how nice the training facility is. Imagine that as the stadium. So then people who haven't been to the training facility because it's still locked down. And if you've been to the stadium, imagine that level of detail and how nice that is as a training facility. It's like, Mo, you, you, would, you, would, you would lose your mind. Yeah. I went to Austin FC Stadium. I'm like, yo. It's like these stadiums just keep getting better and better and like just these more more investments as they come into the league it's just, it's just only going to be great for the sport i'm so excited for the future of soccer and it's like i wish i can like time travel because these young kids you know i don't want to say they don't know how they how good they have it but they um, don't <laughs> it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity and hopefully uh we can with more with more investment we're just going to see a, a better brand of soccer and you know, 2026 World Cup in the United States can't come soon enough. That's yeah. all I'm going to say. 100%. So, but with that being said, thanks again, Dante. That's our show for this week. Subscribe, rate, and review. It helps us get discovered. Follow us on all the socials at Two Cents FC. L's been working by the clock. Got some wonderful things in the works. Um, as we alluded to, he checked out Columbus Crew last week. We got some more things on the way. Check out our merch at two cents sports.shop. It helps support the show so we can get wonderful legends on the show like Dante Washington. And then tweet us your comments on the show and any topics you want me or L to discuss. As you guys know, every Friday, Unfiltered Thoughts and Opinions, the only soccer show that gives you that. And hopefully you guys continue to support. Much love. Peace out. Thanks. <laughs>